Dan, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here with me. You know, seeing you, it takes me back to the two times that I've been lucky enough to work with you. And I, what, what stands out to me the most is um, I remember I was in the season of really struggling with stuff, just a lot of different things. And you always kept the door to that big, pretty office of yours open to me. And um, I really appreciated that. So thank you. Well, you know, it was modeled for me. So, I mean, it's um, luckily I, you know, in my years of Black and Decker, I was fortunate and you don't realize this in your younger years, mm -hmm. how much of your leadership style is shaped by others, both positively and negatively. And I was just fortunate to have great leaders and it sort of became natural to model your style after how you were managed. So it's helpful. I love it. I love it. Well, let us know for those that don't know who you are and what you do. My name is Dan Gregory. Um, I am primarily a, a husband of a wonderful wife of 35 years, which is crazy to think that uh, that um, I've been married 35 years. I have six great kids. Um, ages 22 to 32. And some are in California, Nashville, sort of scattering out. Um, so that's my primary role. I always tell people um, that they say, well, what, what hobbies do you have? I say, well, if a hobby is what you spend your time and your money on, then I spent most of my time and my money and my six kids. And so now I'm broke. So I guess it was a good hobby. So uh, th thrilled to have six kids. It's a real blessing now uh, just to see them grow into adulthood. And I've got three grandkids. So I'm officially old age now. Um, but I, I started off, I graduated from the Ohio State University um, back when anybody could get in. And uh, I started my career at Black and Decker in 1988 and spent over 20 years there. And really, uh, that was the 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 formative years of my business background and something that I've taken to every role I've done because it was there that I watched brands develop. It was great to be in a company that had, you know, a handful of truly world class brands with Black and Decker. And and we in the in the uh, early 1990s, um, uh, we were w watching a shift in the business, and we had these competitors coming in. And the biggest one was Makita. So if you're familiar with Power Tools, Makita was a was a Japanese power tool that was really wedging a foothold right between Black and Decker uh, consumer and Black & Decker Industrial. And Black & Decker created the tool market in 1910. And so, but we just watched the, our share erode where they went right after lumber yards. And we, for a while, this was back when brands, you know, in the early 90s, not a lot of great research around brands yet. And um, we we couldn't understand why the, the, the lumber uh, yards and why the tradesmen weren't picking the best tool. They were picking a brand. And so we did all this research and it came down to these fundamental easy stuff when you talk to customers, right? And basically somebody who buys tools for a living doesn't want a tool with the same name as their toaster. It's like, I, I don't like, cause we had just bought Black & Decker um, small appliances from GE and we we thought it was a great acquisition. We were integrating into the company and it, it there were, there's a lot of great things about it to put Black & Decker on the map globally, but it sure didn't help our industrial tool sales. And so um, we did this, this, uh, this exercise where we took all the tools and we, the competitors and ours, we painted them all black. We gave them to the, um, the end users and we said, tell us what the best tools are. Well, in four out of five cases, the Black & Decker Industrial would, would come out, well, I would prefer this tool. But when we put the labels and the logos and the colors all back on them, they came back and they said, we want Makita. This is a dead last. And so that was my first time of really understanding it truly is about brand development. It's about connecting with the consumer emotionally, trying to find out what they want and telling a story. And so uh, we... We threw a, a lot of really what I'd call grassroots belly-to-belly -belly marketing started DeWalt, 
Um, and it was meager. I remember the first year sales, we, we hope we'd do 50, 50 uh, million dollars. And lo and behold, you know, 20 some years later, it's a global juggernaut of a brand worth billions of dollars around the globe. And it started with the same tools that were Black & Decker Industrial relabeled DeWalt. So it wasn't just about the product. It was about the story you tell, how you perceive the brand, getting to know the customer and connecting with that customer. And I'll never forget that because I used that and then every subsequent role I was in with Hoover and Dirt Devil and Sherwin Williams and in my nonprofit work and the other things I've done about how do you connect with that user? Wow, that's great. So through all the tenure that you've had, what would you say that you kind of see mistakes people making in the marketplace when they're trying to build their brand or push their products forward? I think the biggest mistake that that people can make is um, looking at what's currently there and and saying we have to compete with that. Like like if if this is what's working today, then our competition needs to we it needs to look a lot. A lot like that looks, but with a few more bells and whistles, as opposed to talking with the consumer and truly finding out, but what's wrong with that current offering and how do we do this differently? I mean, and you can look at so many examples of that. I mean, I was just talking to a friend today over a, a, a breakfast and we were both commenting whether you like my pillow or not. Uh, whether you like Mike, Mike Lindell or not, the fact that he took something as basic as a pillow, it's a pillow that no one put a lot of thought into. It's just a pillow. You get a pillow at Walmart or Target, and he put a story around it. He put marketing around it. He talked about wh what, what an amazing night's nice sleep you get. And it's amazing what he's done selling pillows. And and then broadcast, and then from there moving into sheets and everything else he's done. And and he reinvented the category. He didn't compete with it. And so I think what I see today, and I and I, and I see it happening quicker. I mean, you've got to reinvent what people think. You've got to get ahead of the competition because the because the world is moving so fast. Uh, somebody just asked me the other day, um, well, no one's ever going to be able to beat Amazon. And I said, you know, we've been saying that throughout the ages. I remember when I was in my undergrad at OSU um, in the textbook and, and the professor that was teaching the business class said that no one will be able to overtake Kmart. Just let that sink in. Like Kmart's structure, how they go to business, their market share, their dominance. I mean, who's going to overtake Kmart? And, and right now, if you ask, you know, my kids, I don't think they've ever been in a Kmart. So the, the, the next generation is going to be um, really based on what people really are looking for next, not what they've got now. And I think we, we just lack that creativity. We're too afraid to take that risk. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I'm thinking about, um, you know, the idea of helping people understand how to think about a purchase decision versus just comparing, you know, your apples to their oranges, but you know, your point about really reinventing your category through your story. Um, I had the thought the other day about, you know, when you're in school and the new kid comes, you know, maybe the new girl or the new guy and you look at them, you're like, okay, well, she's got this and I don't have that and she's got that and I don't have that. And you're comparing yourself, not really understanding the uniqueness that you already had before they stepped up on the scene, you know, um, and really using all of that you bring to the table to your benefit versus trying to go kind of, sometimes be a copycat in, in a bad way to um oh, some absolutely people. yeah and and recognizing it's 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 about um creating trust and capturing that lifetime value there's another friend of mine that we were talking about um his idea of getting into the service businesses which you'd say well gosh who would want to get into like the lawn business or or hvac or those businesses where they seem so challenging but yet if you think about it i think rarely does somebody switch companies. If, if you've got somebody mowing your lawn, I don't think you're switching because somebody offers you $5 less. You, you switch because your service is not what it was or that is what they, what they promise is not being delivered. 
And and I think that if you went in and with a with a service offering that really met the needs of the consumer, you wouldn't need to charge five dollars less. You could charge five dollars more. And then, and then how do you go in there and 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 <clears throat> create a lifetime value where if you're doing a great job on the lawn and they trust you, would they trust you now if you started a painting company? Would they then trust you if you tr started a siding company or a roofing company? And based on today's culture, I think the answer is absolutely. People are looking for trusted relationships. Everybody is been saying, I mean, you, you've seen on things like Thumbtack and stuff, people want recommendations. They want, they want to know who they can trust. It's never about price. The price has got to be within line, but it never comes down to price. It comes down to who do I trust? Oh, that's so good. So the other day I talked with you and you shared with me all this stuff that I didn't even know about you and it just blew me away. So can you talk a little bit about your nonprofit work and how that's come to life in recent years? Yeah, so I uh, I uh, attend a, a, a church um, called Christ Community Chapel. I had been going there for probably, I don't know, six, seven years maybe. And there's just a, a, a wonderfully gifted visionary pastor there. And and we were talking one day as, as I was just talking to him about some of my career transitions and things I wanted to do. And, and one of those areas was really um, getting involved with men that struggle with drug and al alcohol addiction because that hit close to my own family. And, and I just recognized there just wasn't a lot of, um, of, of really what I call holistic options where families can take a loved one to get that kind of help. And a lot of well-meaning organizations that do different parts and different pieces, but a connected sort of um, ministry that could take somebody from point A to point B. And, and as we really dug into it, um, talking to different experts, it really, the, the strategy was fairly simple, which most strategies are. It's the execution and the implementation that falls down is that, you know, as I talk to people, well, what, what does it take? I mean, what, 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 how is the ball being dropped? What can we do to make this better? And I remember talking to one uh, medical doctor who has been helping people in addiction for years and years and he said, really, it comes down to men did, need to be sober for one year, that they need one year of sobriety, and it's tough to reach that point. Um, they need a, a healthy and a safe place to live. They need a vocation and a, and a job, and, and they need future. They need to be able to think about their future and have a future to think about. And they need a strong, healthy support network. So that became the basis of okay. Well, we let's let's let that be our strategy. That's our end game. How do we develop a curriculum and a course of study and a facility that can help do that? And so um, we just on a Friday afternoon just said, let's do this. And this is you know a lot of churches don't want to do that. Like I even said, now this is sort of messy. Like we're dealing with men with addiction. Um, you, you might want, should we just do a little, a lot better job at vacation Bible school, right? It's, it only lasts a week. And so he said, we want to jump into the fire. Let's, let's go. And so, um, we started, uh, just another ministry. And what was amazing that I found Kelly is, um, you know, I've got no, um, degree in, in, in addiction or counseling, or, or I'm not a pastor, right? I'm just a guy that, you know, cared and, and had a business background and and spent you know my career sort of solving problems and looking for solutions and i remember laying out a strategy and um the strategy entailed we want to build a facility that can that can handle between 50 and 70 guys we want it to be on a, on a tranquil kind of beautiful piece of property um, we want to raise all the money to build the facility debt free and as we laid that out, I remember people thinking, you're nuts, like you're crazy. Like who do, who doesn't want to do that? Like that just doesn't happen. And so, you know, and talking to like fundraisers and, and people like that, they kept trying to pigeonhole me into, well, you need a lot of detail and people who give big checks. They they, they want to know like the cost of the lighting and they're really into the p &L. And I just never felt that. I go, I don't know. I wouldn't be. I'd want to know what's the story, what's the end game, what 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 makes Restore unique, and so um, you know we created the brochures and did all the right things that you're supposed to do to raise money, 
And I'll be honest, I never used any of it. I, I don't think I ever pulled out a brochure. Um, I, I never provided real deep financials to givers that were giving six figure checks. They would look me in the eyes and they wanted to know we knew what we were doing and they wanted to understand the story. Like, tell me the story. Tell me, tell me why addiction. Tell me how this is different. People with money have vision. Um, they like to give to things that make sense. They like to give to things that are sustainable. And, and I got to tell you, it was an amazing process watching God work. We opened up January 18th of last year, and we opened up debt-free in a beautiful, probably at this point, five or $6 million facility. We got free land from Summit County, beautiful piece of property sitting on a hill. And um, we've got met over 30 men that are now in our ministry and our program, and we've seen lives changed. But it's, it's it was about telling a story. It was about having being passionate about a story, not the financials, or not that those are important. But people don't give to financials. They give to they give to things with meaning. They give to things that they can emotionally connect to. Oh. That was so good. I cannot wait to listen to this back and just hang on everything you just said. But um, I want you to talk to the person who says, that's great for you. You seem like you're a natural storyteller. You know how to get out here, tell your story. But I'm not like that. I really struggle to kind of communicate in regard to story. What kind of word of wisdom would you give them? I would say that I think I think we're we're all more naturally storytellers than we think about than we think we are. We tend to resonate to stories. If you think about all those, I'll call them feel good movies. They're they're not they're not factual. They're factual, but they're not laden with facts. You connect emotionally, and 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 I think that as 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 humans, we connect emotionally with people. And, and what I'd say is you're probably a better storyteller than you think you are. And it, it starts with, I think, something as simple as where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how do we want to get there? And, 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 and I would almost write it out versus financial. The, the financial backs up the narrative and the story. But if you can't just simply say, here's where we are here's where we're going and why it's important. And here's our path to getting there. That's what you got to start with. And, and it might come more and more natural for others, but practice it a little bit. I mean, be able to practice it because it doesn't have to be overly complicated. I found that with Restore, our largest donations came from people who I quite honestly didn't have to over explain the story to because it, it connected in their head. They got it. And, and you can see when people get it and they get it based on the story you tell, not the financials you serve up. The financials back up the story, but they get it from the story level. So that's what I would say. Start with the story. That's awesome. So have you been able to leverage your story to recruit your internal team and those on the inside that are carrying the vision forward? That's a great question because I think the story has to translate internally, right? I think what makes um, any organization unique is that is that that buy-in has to happen from the whole team. It, it can't sit, sit in the executive suite. I mean, everyone's got to own the story. And part of what makes that powerful is cascading that story down and letting them help you rewrite the story as they bring it back up. It's making the assumption that the people in the trenches and the people doing the work have as much to contribute to that story as you do and allowing that story to be somewhat organic and allowing it to flow and allowing it to morph. So for restorative recovery, um, there's a couple of things that will never change. Um, we always say we're Christ-centered, biblically-based, and clinically supported. Those are the tenets behind what we do because we know where we want to take the men. How we take the men can change. The curriculum, the, 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 the phases we do, um, some of the, the structure and how we do things, that's always up for change. And that's got to be owned by, the, by not only um, the staff, but I even think the residents at Restore. So something that unique is at Restore is that um, 
I tell the the guys that are there and they live there. It's a, it's a program where they live there for a full year. Um, some less, some more. But I tell the guys that Restore that Restore is for you and that you are the ultimate owners of Restore. There, there's no, it's a nonprofit, right? No one's making money at Restore. We did this as a gift to men struggling with addiction. So it's amazing when you say you're the owner, which means that you're going to help cook, you're going to help clean, that there, there's no one doing the yard work. And when you drive up to restore, a lot of people go, man, this is just beautiful. How do you maintain it? And I say, well, we we maintain it. The, the people that are here, because they feel like an owner. They've never been to an organization like Restore where you're invited in to be that owner, where you're invited in to provide your input because it is your future. So I think part of it is allowing that vision to be morphed by those people that are doing it. That's good. That's good. So let me ask you this. So you've had all these different experiences over your career, in your life. What do you feel like are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? Boy, I, I would say um, for me, it's about making sure that because because I tend to be a creative, right? So I I can, and I I always joke with people. Um, in, in any given day, I've got ten amazingly creative ideas. The problem is nine of them are really stupid. So I I, I need so it's easy to throw out creativity. It's easy to say here's what we should do. The difficulty is then segmenting which ones are truly good ideas and which ones aren't. But the way you do that is by allowing everyone to participate. Because organizations move forward when there's ownership, right? And so a lot of organizations think just because you create a mission statement or you say, here are our four objectives for the year and they're well spelled out and you've got a Word document and you put them in the posters and they're in the emails that you're done, you can wash your hands. And as, as if a, a written piece of communication or an email is buy-in, it's not. So... There's no strategy that's worth anything if it's not implemented. And the only way you get implementation is to truly get buy-in. So to get buy-in is as you come up with these creative ideas, as you lay out your strategies, taking the time, truly taking the time to um, listen to people, to gather their input, to, to let them know, hey, by the way, and I, I always tell them this, as I seek your input, please don't be offended if I don't use it. I didn't say I was going to use your input. I was going to seek your input because like I have, you know, nine, nine dumb ideas for every one good one. Quite honestly, so does everybody else. So the idea is that everyone around the table has value. And sometimes it's somebody else's idea that gets implemented. Don't be offended if it's not yours. So part of it is that just the education of people going, well, I thought you wanted my opinion. And I always say, well, I did want your opinion. I just didn't tell you I was going to use it. So how do we create a culture where people feel comfortable presenting their ideas, but also being comfortable saying, boy, I presented my ideas, somebody else built on it. And then a, another person really brought it into an amazing a cohesive thought. That's the strategy we want to move forward with being, helping people understand and then getting the buy-in. I love that. So all that you've accomplished, what's next? You know, I, uh, Probably in the in my what I call my Stephen Covey years, where you know I, every year I was doing my mission and my vision, and, and 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 as if as if if I lay that out carefully, it can actually happen. I mean, we've all done strategic planning, and I remember my early years of doing that. You know, and all organizations do it. They lay out these amazingly complex ten binder three year plans, the speed of which the world is moving. To think that you're going to pull out your strategic plan from three years ago, think think of that now. I mean, who's using their 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 strategy that they created before COVID? Nobody. That 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 document isn't worth the paper it's printed on. So I think the key is is to sort of say, what are my values? What do I really want to do? Where where do, where do I feel I'm being led to go? And then holding on to the tactics loosely if that makes sense, saying, I think this is where I want to go. Now, how do I, how do I let that organically develop? So for me, for 2023, I've already spelled out, here are the books I want to read. 
Here's the physical things I want to do. Here's the exercise I want to achieve. I can get very specific on those. But then as I look at restore, I go, boy, here's where I loosely think I, as, as I look into the future of restore, I'm okay looking into it saying, I think I know where we're going. It's a little cloudy because you just can't see clearly. So how do you say that's the direction? I don't know if we'll stay on path all the time, but I want to be willing to, to pivot. So in my personal life, in my business life, in my nonprofit life, it's that ability to see where you want to go, but quickly pivot. Oh, this has been so good, Dan. I have to talk you into chatting with me every so often because I'm like, I'm getting super smart over here listening to you. <laughs> but um, Advice is free. Implementation is tough. <laughs> right. That's the tricky part. But um, for those listening that want more information about Restore, might want to know how they can contribute financially, get involved, or maybe they have a loved one that think they think might benefit from the services. How can they get more information? The best place to go is just uh, our website, which is restoreaddictionrecovery.com. Um, we're located in Southern Akron. Um, there's people that can talk to you. There's, there's, there's volunteer opportunities. We're growing right rapidly because it's one of the few programs where it costs nothing to come. And the men can save money while they're there. So it's a free um, place to go for those guys that really need help. And we've just been blessed to have amazing donors um, uh, that that help with us. And then through the way the, the program works, there's a workforce development um, component where the guys work with organizations while they're there. So the organizations benefit because they're getting great people to, to do the work they need done. And then they pay restore, which then begins paying the men. So it's a beautiful relationship. And just the 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 uh, the blessing that our guys have been to the different organizations we work with has been amazing as well. So restoreaddictionrecovery.com, uh, there's information there. And uh, it, like I said, it's been a real blessing. And it's been great talking with you. It's been great catching up with you. Same here. This has been a real treat. And um very proud of the work you're doing over at Restore. This is just awesome to hear about. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.